Undertale, the indie RPG that took the internet by storm, is now 5 years old, which is absolutely unbelievable. I remember playing the game for the first time 5 years ago, instantly falling in love with its quirky characters, fun battle system, and unique charm. After 5 long years though, I've wanted to take a bit of a step back and re-examine why Undertale was such a special game in the first place. If you're watching this video, chances are that you're an Undertale fan, or have at least heard of the game before. Since September 2015 when the game launched, Undertale has had a massive presence on the internet. But in case you don't know what that is, I'll give you a brief summary. If you've already played or heard of the game before, feel free to skip to this timestamp. Undertale is an independently developed role-playing game developed mainly by Toby Fox, with some help from his friend Temi Chang for the art. A long time ago, monsters and humans lived together in harmony, but after war broke out, the humans sealed the monsters under Mount Ebbet with a magical spell, leaving them trapped underground. The story follows you, a young little kid who fell down the mountain into the world of monsters, tasked with making your way out. Undertale's main gimmick is that unlike most RPGs, you don't actually have to hurt anyone in this one. Peacefully talk your way out of encounters, and befriend the monsters that you encounter. You also have the option to kill the monsters you come across, and your every decision impacts the story. Many critics praise the game for having meaningful player choices, relatable and quirky characters, a fun battle system, and a seriously good story. On the other hand, many on the internet also hated the game, mainly because of the rather annoying toxic fanbase the game had amassed. More recently, the game has acquired meme status, with everyone's favorite funny bone man taking center stage. The game's multiple endings and significant plot points have been talked about and deconstructed many, many times at this point, but today, I want to focus on a less talked about area of the game, one that I really don't see much appreciation for outside of a few instances. I'm talking about Undertale's very first area, the ruins. The ruins is the first area the player navigates through, serving mainly as the tutorial area of Undertale to get the player familiar with the game's mechanics. But what many people just don't realize is how well this area is actually designed, and how it manages to teach a player the game's rules and morality system in a very clear and natural way. The ruins is very very well crafted and accounts for multiple different actions the player can decide to take, making it the perfect tutorial area for a game like Undertale. I know that even the ruins has already been analyzed to hell and back, but after 5 long years of the game being out, becoming hated on the internet and being a meme, I feel like I would be doing it a disservice to not go back and analyze some of its great game design. Oh yeah, I'm going to be spoiling the first area of the game, so if you haven't progressed past the ruins yet, I'd advise you to go and do that first. I won't be spoiling anything past the ruins, however. When you start your first playthrough of Undertale, you don't have much background knowledge about the game. That is, if you were lucky enough to dodge the fandom spewing spoilers left and right. The only information you have to go off of is the small introduction the game gives you on the title screen, and the basic controls. Right off the bat, you are dropped directly into the first area without any instruction. From here, the first logical step for the player to take is to walk to the right, since that's the way the path on the ground goes, and that you also, um can't actually go anywhere else. In the next room, the player will meet their first monster, a little unsuspecting flower named Flowey. After a small bit of dialogue, Flowey will bring your HP to 1 by telling you to run into the little white friendliness pellets he will spawn, which are actually just bullets. After almost killing you, Flowey gets knocked away by a friendly face, the one, the only, Goat Mom Torio. Not only does this small sequence do such a great job at setting the expectation that there's more to this game than at face value, it teaches the player a very simple but important rule. Dodge the stuff. Obviously, this rule is used throughout the entire game, because it's the backbone of what the game's battles are built off of. But moving forward, Toriel will introduce herself as the caretaker of the ruins, and will ask you to follow her. The player may be skeptical of her, having experienced what they just have, but since up is the only way you can go, the player is forced to follow. The player will step into the ruins for the first time, greeted with its signature pink-purple color scheme. Immediately, the player is drawn towards the little spark in the middle, almost subconsciously. Interacting with it will prompt the player to save the game, while also informing them that their HP has been fully restored. The eye-grabbing design of the save points allows the game to introduce them to the player without actually needing to tell them explicitly. 
Toriel will then bring you to a room with a dummy and tell you to talk to it as opposed to striking it. At this moment, the player is first introduced to the game's morality system, the slay and spare mechanic. The game puts the player into a battle with the dummy, allowing the player to get familiar with the battle UI. From here, the player can either fight the dummy or talk to it. Of course, doing what Toriel asks of you will make her happy, which can be a decision-making factor for some people. Whereas if you decided to strike the dummy, Toriel will tell you that the dummies are not for fighting, and will say the line, we do not want to hurt anybody, do we? Which further hints to the player to try and resolve fights peacefully. There is no consequence for killing or sparing the dummy, so it serves as a great way to have Toriel correct the player if they killed the dummy. Immediately after this though, the player is presented with their first RANDOM encounter. Random in quotations because this encounter is 100% scripted by the way. You will always run into this frogget in this exact spot. This encounter's purpose is to let the player take what they just learned and put it into practice, giving the player their first choice of the game, spare or kill. Conveniently, this frogget is the only frogget that you could kill in one hit with the default weapon which is 100% an intentional design decision made to allow the player to kill it if they wanted to. If you didn't quite hit the center of the attack meter, the frogget will not die and Toriel will scare the frogget away, which also happens if you do anything else. After this, Toriel will literally hold your hand through the puzzle, where she then says, maybe puzzles are a bit too dangerous for now, which helps to enforce Toriel's overprotectiveness and mother-like qualities, as well as reference other RPGs for having too much hand-holding in their games. It also helps to build a small connection between the player and Toriel, which will prove infinitely helpful later on. After walking through Toriel's uh, challenge hallway, Toriel will give you a cell phone which you can use to call her and have various interactions with her in order to get to know her a bit better. She will then tell you to not leave the room and to wait for her to come back after going to do something. Waiting in this room does nothing, and after getting impatient most players will advance anyway. In this next room, there's a frogget NPC that once again tells the player to consider using Mercy to resolve conflicts, which is convenient because this is the first room that the players can start running into actual random encounters, allowing them full freedom to make the decisions they want to make. During your walk through the ruins, Toriel will call you various times for trivial things, which helps the player get to know Toriel just a bit more and build even further of a connection between the player and Toriel. Eventually, you'll run into Napsablook, the pessimistic ghost who's really just not feeling it right now. Napsablook serves as a sort of mini-boss, acting as a checkpoint to make sure the player understands the axe system, which they must use to cheer him up and get him to show you his super slick, dapper book fit, which you can then react nicely to to end the fight. Not too far ahead, there's a room with three, technically four, frogged NPCs lined up. The first two froggets give off some general information, like how to put the game into full screen. But the third frogget gives off some pretty important information. The third frogget tells you that you can spare a monster when their name is yellow and asks how you like it. However, there's an extremely important line here. The frogget will tell you that you may need to spare someone even if their name isn't yellow, which is an important detail used later. Eventually you'll find Toriel, while well, she'll heal you up if you're hurt and then take you to her home where she reveals that she's baked you a wonderful cinnamon butterscotch pie. With the soft music playing in the background, Toriel will tell you that she's prepared a room just for you, then smell something in the kitchen and run off to check it, leaving you free to explore the house. If you go to your room and head to bed, Toriel will place a small slice of pie next to the bed for you to enjoy when you wake up, which if you inspect, tells you that it heals all of your HP. This moment really drives home Toriel's hospitality, getting the player to care about her in the process. After heading to the living room and talking to Toriel, mentioning that you want to leave the ruins will make her get up and ask you to stay there while she does something. Most players will be put off by her sudden mood shift that she has and will attempt to look for her, eventually leading them down into the previously off-limits basement. Here, Toriel will tell you that she's seen children come, leave the ruins, and die before, explaining the reason for her overprotectiveness. Not wanting the same fate for you, she wants to destroy the exit so that nobody will ever be able to leave again. Once you reach the end, Toriel will ask you to prove to her that you are strong enough to survive on your own, entering battle with you. This boss fight is perhaps the most important part of the entire tutorial, as it acts as the final challenge the player must face before graduating from the tutorial. It's also the first time the player is fighting a character that is relevant to the story which can make the player deliberate their choice more carefully than a random monster would. Another key factor at play here is the player having just received the butterscotch pie, a super powerful healing item. 
Being given a powerful healing item right before a boss fight creates a sense of danger for the player, possibly preventing the player from experimenting too much as to not make a mistake and die. Naturally, the first thing a player who does not want to kill Toriel will try doing is acting, since they have been taught that acting is the solution to fights. However, the game makes it clear quickly that talking does nothing against Toriel. Remember that Froggit from a little while back? Yeah, that Froggit's advice is for this very moment. The solution to this battle is to keep sparing her. At first, it'll seem like this is doing nothing, but once she starts to say things like, what are you doing, it becomes quite clear that this is in fact doing something. This also teaches the player how most boss fights work in Undertale, with the main objective usually being to exhaust all of their battle dialogue. However, not every player would have figured out that sparing her when her name wasn't yellow was the right solution. In fact, the game almost conditions the player not to know what to do in this situation, as the tool the game tells the player to use to get out of fights, the act button, does not work. The only way the player would know to do this is if they just so happened to talk to this random froggy in one of the rooms. The player may get stuck and attempt to kill Toriel, thinking it's their only option. Typically in other video games, fighting a story-relevant character, especially a friendly tutorial character, usually means that they can't be killed, but this isn't just some random RPG. Undertale is all about defying conventions, so once the player has racked enough damage against Toriel, BAM! The remainder of her HP all wiped out in one hit, which may come as a surprise to many. Once the player has finally killed Toriel, the game makes damn sure to rub what you just did in your face, with an extremely sad death animation where Toriel will turn to dust, leaving just her soul and yours before hers shatters to pieces. Just past this door is a long hallway, perfect for letting the guilt of what you just did sink in. Past here though, at the end of the ruins, a familiar face will be waiting for you. Flowey's role here in this room is to judge the actions you chose during your adventure in the ruins. In this position, a lot of players will feel like they did the wrong thing, or they'll feel guilty for killing Toriel after all the hospitality she's shown you. Here's where the game really shines though, as many players will attempt to close the game and reload their save in order to spare Toriel, which would work in just any other game. But again, this isn't just some random RPG. No, we're playing Undertale, remember? The game drops some small hints when you start fighting Toriel again, where she tells you that you look like you've seen a ghost. After sparing her, players will advance to the next room where Flowey will reveal that he remembers what you did. He remembers that you killed Toriel, and he calls you out on closing your game and reloading your save to spare her. It's this bone-chilling moment that really lets you know that this isn't just some normal RPG, and definitely sets your expectations properly for the rest of the game to come. And with that, the player exits the ruins, adequately prepared for their adventure through the underground. The entire area does such a great job at naturally teaching the player how to play the game, and overall is just excellent game design. Toriel's boss fight alone is an example of brilliant game design. The ruins manage to capture so much of what Undertale is all about in just its one area, and that's why I love it so much. It's a shame that the area gets overlooked so much when everyone's too busy talking about the haha funny skeleton man. So I thought it would just be nice to take a step back for the 5th anniversary and appreciate the thought that went into just this one area. 